here for a minute. <clears throat> So I'll be going over some graph stuff today. Um, so I'll start with a review of stuff you guys should have already seen when Brandon gave this, gave you guys a graph lecture. So there are a few terms you need to know when talking about a graph. Um, vertex edge whether the graph is directed or undirected weighted degree and connected So a graph is basically a, con a collection of vertices and edges. So these are your vertices. So this is a vertex right here. And um, this is a vertex. And then this would be an edge. An edge is basically a pair of vertices that are being connected. Um, so that's vertex edge. And then this right now is an undirected graph because there isn't a direction associated with any of the edges. Um, you can go from this vertex, you can go from A to B or B to A. It doesn't matter, it's an undirected graph. So that's what undirected means. Directed would be if we had like an arrow saying that we can only go from A to B. That means we can't go from B back to A. Um, and then weighted, it means there's some weight associated with each edge. So maybe this edge has weight 7, 3, 2, just some value. doesn't have to be an integer. It can be 7.5. Generally, they are integer weights, but... It's just some notion of weight. It's not all a unit weight. And then the degree of a vertex is just the number of edges incident with that vertex. So here there are two edges incident with this vertex that are connected to it. So the degree of B is equal to two. Here there's only one edge with this vertex C, so the degree the degree of C is equal to 1. If we wanted to add more edges, now the degree of B is equal to 3, and so on. It's just the number of edges uh, that are basically connected to a, a vertex. So that's degree. And then a connected graph is a graph where you can get from every vertex to every other vertex. All right, so this graph right now is connected because we can go from C to B. Um, there's a path between every pair of vertices. If we added another vertex, maybe D out here, that's not connected to anything, then this graph is no longer connected because there is no way to go from A to D. All right, so this graph would not be connected anymore. And this, this could happen. Maybe we have just like another small graph out here between D and E. And this whole thing is one giant graph. So that's some basic terminology for a graph. There are different ways to represent a graph. So there are different representations. Um, yeah, different graph representations. So there are, the most basic one is an edge list. Um, this is just the pair of all the edges. So for this particular graph, 
Now let's get rid of some of this stuff. So if I have weight two, maybe weight ten. So for this particular graph, the edge list would be like A, B, and it would be like weight two. So that's the edge from A to B, weight two, B to F, weight three, B to C, weight 10, and A to C, weight seven. So it's just an edge list. An edge list is just a list of all the edges. And in an undirected graph, the order doesn't really matter. So AC7 is the same as CA7. Okay, so that's an edge list. That's the really basic way to represent a graph. The next method is an adjacency list. And an adjacency list, basically you have a list of all of the vertices. So A, B, C, and F. And then each of these each of these vertices has a list of pairs, and those are the vertices and uh, their associated weight that they are adjacent to. So A is adjacent to B and C, so we're going to have a pair B2 to represent this edge right here. And we're going to have pair C7 to represent this edge. B is going to have three pairs. It'll have A2. Notice here in an undirected graph, if A is adjacent to B, B is also adjacent to A. Um, then it'll have C10 and F3. C will have A7, B10, and F is going to have B3. So that's another common way to represent your graph. So you guys should have seen this already. And then the last way, uh, the last commonly used way is an adjacency matrix. Adjacency matrix. And so this is going to have a, it's going to have, it's basically a two dimensional matrix, A, B, C, F, A, B, C, F. So it'll look something like this. And then on the diagonal, I don't know, you can just put zero. It doesn't really matter. This represents going from A to A. So it's if this is your I and J, each entry in the cell represents the edge going from I to J. So here, the cell represents the edge going from A to B. So from A to B, there's an edge with weight 2. From A to C, there's an edge with weight 10. And from A to F, there is no edge, so we're going to have infinity. All right, and so in Java, you can't really, there isn't an infinity value unless you're using doubles. So you just do like integer.max value or something, some really large number. Okay, and then for an undirected graph, this is going to be symmetric, a symmetric matrix. So now B to C, we're going to have weight 10. Sorry, A to C is weight 7. B to C is weight 10. Then B to F is weight 3. Weight 3. C to F is infinity because there's no edge. And that is our adjacency matrix for that graph. So those are the different ways to represent a graph. Um, okay, so let's get into the algorithms. So I'll briefly go over two that you should have already seen. So BFS, 
stands for breadth first search. And this is going to use a Q. And what this algorithm does, basically, you have a starting vertex, and then you're going to look at all the vertices that are one step away. So this is for an unweighted graph. Let's add a few more vertices. Okay, so let's let's use A as our starting vertex. We're gonna look at all of the vertices one step away from A. So we'll look at let's see. So we'll look at B and C. They're both one step away from A. And then next we're gonna look at vertices two steps away from A. So we'll look at D and F next. And then we'll look at the vertices that are three steps away. Three. So that's just E. So this is, uh, so how that works is you use a Q. So we'll add A to our Q. So if this is your Q, we will we'll add A to the Q, and then we'll look at A's neighbors, um, and we'll add its neighbors to the Q also. So we'll remove A and add its neighbors. And so now we'll look at B. So the order we're visiting them is A, and then now we're going to look at B and add its neighbors. So B is adjacent to... D and F, and we're not going to add neighbors that we've already added um, because we, we're, we've already seen them. So then we visited B. Now we look at C. C doesn't have any new neighbors, so we just visit it. And I'm going to shift this over. So now we look at D's neighbors, and we'll add E. And so we visit D. Then we'll look at F's neighbors. We've already added E, so we'll just visit F, and then we'll visit E, and so now we visited everything, and this is the order that we visited them in. So you can see here, that's 0, and then we visit B and C, that's 1, D and F 2, and E is 3. So you can see we visit them in the order based on how many steps away from A they are. Okay, so that's how you use a Q to do that. Then DFS is pretty much the exact same algorithm, but you use a stack now instead. So you would add A, So you'd add A, then you remove it and add its adjacencies, B and C. And now because it's a stack, we're going to remove the one at the end, the vertex at the end. So we'll remove C and add its adjacencies. There's nothing new there. Now we'll look at B and add its adjacencies. So we'll add D and F. So we visit B. And now we'll look at the one at the end. And we'll add E. So we visited F. And now we'll look at E again. And nothing new there. And then we'll add D. So that's how DFS works. So you can see the path it sort of took. Went there and here. So that's sort of the DFS tree. So it's a, this is just a simple example. Um, so BFS is always going to, the first time you see a node, it will find the shortest path. The shortest path, assuming uh, there's no like weights or anything involved. Um, DFS is good for like testing connectivity or just finding any path. Uh, let's say it's good for testing connectivity. Um, it's generally 
there, there's a lot of more complicated uses for DFS that are a little bit more complex. Um, they're not as obvious. Okay, so those are the two basic... So, so all of this should have been reviewed up to this point. So now I'm going to go over a new algorithm that you haven't seen. Um, I'll go over Dijkstra's algorithm. So Dijkstra. So Dijkstra, what Dijkstra is going to do is it's going to find the shortest paths to each vertex from a starting vertex uh, and a weighted graph. So the key thing here is that Dijkstra works in a weighted graph. If you remember BFS, it solved the same problem, but for an unweighted graph. So now let's say we have this graph. So let's say we have a graph that looks like this. So these are our weights, these are our vertices. So let me label these A, B, C, D, E, and F. Okay, so we'll use A as our starting vertex. So let's just try to find the shortest path to F. So if we did BFS, the path they would find would just be this one, right? Because that's just one step away. But really, the shortest path is going to be if we take all of these, all of these vertex vertices, and go all the way around. So that's four, five, six, seven, eight, versus this path, which is nine, and this path, which is ten. So this path that seems really long, that involves more vert vertices, has a lower weight than this path that only involves one edge, right? So BFS isn't going to know how to find this. So one, uh, one obvious thing you can do to make it work with BFS is just everywhere there's a weight, you just replace that edge with, you just split it up. So this was weight 2. So let's make it two edges instead. We'll just add a little dummy vertex right there. This was weight 10, let's add 10 dummy vertices. So one, two, three, four, six. Just pretend like there's 10 vertices in there, right? So one, two, three, four. Yeah, so you can see it, that's not very efficient, but you, you could do it that way and then make VFS work. But we that's not very efficient because what if we have an edge with weight 100 then when we split it up into 100 different vertices our running time is going to be really low 
So we need to come up with a better solution to that. So what we're going to do is keep track of the paths we, we see throughout the graph and order them by the least weight. So, for example, we'll have a priority queue. So that's what we'll have. We'll have a priority queue. So this can be our priority queue. And so this is the min weight path at the top. So we'll have the min weight path at the top. So first we're just going to start off with the path A, and it's just a degenerate path, so it has weight zero. There's nothing really going on. Um, so now we're going to look at A's adjacent vertices. So A is adjacent to B and F. So we're going to add two more paths to our, uh, to our priority queue. We'll add a path from A to F, or we'll add a path from A to B. And this is going to have weight 2. And we'll add a path from A to F with weight 10. OK, and so. Now we're done with that. So we've added this one and we've added that one. So the next thing we want to do so now we look at the least weight path again and we're going to look at the vertices adjacent to the last vertex in that path. So B is adjacent to E and C. And so, sorry. As we remove them, we're going to have this visited list that we keep updated. So we visited A because we removed a path that ended with A. And it had weight zero. Okay. So now we're going to remove this path. So A to B with weight 2. And we're going to add all of the adjacencies, everything that was adjacent to B, we're going to add those new paths on. So we're going to add A, B, C with weight 4. And we're going to add A, B, E with weight 7. So notice here that the minimum weight path is still at the top. Uh, I'm just adding them in that order. In reality, you'll have to do some sorting uh, using like a heap-based structure. I'm not sure if you've seen that yet, but Java has its own priority queue class that you can use. OK. So now we've found the path from A to B with the least weight is 2. OK, so now we're going to remove the least weight path again. And so we have A, B, C with weight 4. And we're going to add all of the adjacencies from C. So C was adjacent to D and B, but we've already visited B right here. Um, so this is like our visited list. So we're not going to add B again. We're just going to add D. So A, what was it? B, C, D. And this is going to have weight 4 plus 1. So five. Okay. And so notice, even though we added AF at the very beginning, it isn't moving up because all of these paths have a lower total weight. So 
they're going to be they're going to have a higher priority in the priority queue because we want the minimum weight path to be at the top. Okay, so now we'll remove this path and we'll get 5 A B C D So A, B, C, D, and it's adjacent to E, so we'll add that. A, B, C, D, E, and that has weight six. So, okay, so good. So now we'll remove this one. And we'll get weight six, A, B, C, D, E. So this is the shortest path from A to E. And notice here that we found this long, that this path that involves more edges rather than this one right here because it has a lower total weight. Okay. So we remove this and add its adjacencies. So it's adjacent to F. So now, let me just shift some things down so I have room. A, B, C, D, E. So now I added that. So here I'm going to remove this path right here. But since I've already visited E, E is already in my visited list and I already have the shortest path to E, I'm just gonna skip it. I'm not gonna do anything with it. I'm not going to add its adjacencies or anything. I'm just gonna completely ignore it. So I remove it and ignore it. Okay. And so now I look at this path and I remove it and add it to my visited list. A, B, C, D, E, F with weight eight. And so that is our last path. And so now here we see F, but we've already visited F, so we're just going to ignore it again like we did with the other vertex. Okay, so as you can see here in our visited list, we have a list of all of the vertices, all of the vertices, all paths to the vertex, each vertex that is the shortest. So this represents the shortest path from A to A just like a degenerate path at zero. This is the shortest path from A to B, um, and it's weight two. This is the shortest path from A to C, and it uses vertex B, um, and it has weight four. A to D has weight five. A to E has weight six. And notice here that we're using A, B, C, D, E rather than A, B, E because it has a lower weight, and Dijkstra found that even though it involves more edges. That's the important point here. BFS would not have found this path correctly. And then this last one, A to F, likewise it doesn't take the AF path or ABE F path, instead it takes the one all the way around, the graph, to get the shortest weight or the least weight path. And so like I said, this is the shortest path from a starting vertex, in this case A, to each of the other vertices in the graph. So, that's a basic example. So a real world example of this, you can imagine if you have some map of and some like roads. So maybe this is Atlanta. 
And this is New York. I don't know, Las Vegas. Uh, and I don't know. You have Seattle up here. So you have some cities, and then there are some roads connecting them. Maybe there's some like small town. Yeah, that's in the middle of the ocean. But there's some small towns here. Maybe you go up here. And each of these might have different weights, right? Because maybe there's a big long highway to go down to Atlanta and then up to Seattle rather than taking some intermediate paths. So maybe this has like a really low weight, three, three, three. Um, then maybe this road is always really crowded and it has weight 100, something like that. You can, you can imagine the traffic on each road and how large the road is and the speed limit, and you can factor in all these different things and generate a weighted map of the United States. So then if you wanted to find the quickest way to go from Atlanta to Seattle, you, you could apply Dijkstra's algorithm to find the shortest path. So that, that's like a real world application to find a path from Atlanta to Seattle and like a map or something, or Atlanta to Las Vegas, stuff like that. So it's important because in BFS, it might, it might find the shortest path, but it might take a bunch of really expensive, crowded roads. It might not uh, give you the path that's actually the quickest based on the weight. Because obviously, an interstate is going to be much quicker generally than taking back roads or something. It'll let you cover more distance quickly. So that's an application of Dijkstra um, in the real world. Uh, so it's used a lot in uh, programming competitions for a similar purpose, just to find the shortest path in a weighted graph. Um, so it's just a good algorithm to know. That's a common problem that shows up a lot. So there is one catch with Dijkstra. It doesn't work if there are negative edge weights. And so I can show you just a basic example why that is. Because we say that the first time we see a vertex and add it to the visited list, that's when that's when we say we found the shortest path to that vertex. But that's not necessarily true if there are negative edge weights. So imagine you have some, verte some vertices here. So this is like weight 1,000, 1,000. I don't know, these weights don't really matter, 1,000, 1,000. But then here, we have negative 4,000 on this edge right here. So obviously, it's going to be better to go from B, to get from B to D, to take this path, because the total weight is going to be zero, right? Rather than this weight three path right here. So... But Dijkstra isn't going to take this 1,000 because it's going to see this number and say, oh, well, this path is smaller, so let's, let's go look here first. So Dijkstra doesn't know about this negative edge weight down here, so it can't handle that. So that's just one thing. It, it's not really, it doesn't really show up in a graph where your weights are distances because obviously you don't have negative distances, but it can catch you up in some other algorithm. So that's just an important thing to remember with Dijkstra. It does not work with negative edge weights. Okay. So the next algorithm I will talk about is called Floyd Warshall.
I don't know if I spelled that right, but you can look it up. Um, so Floyd Warshall, what it's going to do is it's going to find all the, the shortest path between every pair of vertices. So this is all pairs. So this is all pairs of vertices, the shortest path between them. So the difference is in Dijkstra, we found the shortest path from A to every vertex, but it, it's not necessarily the shortest path. We didn't find anything that says something about the shortest path from C to F, for example. Floyd Warshall will find the shortest path from A to F, A to E, A to D, A to B, A to C, B to E, B to D, etc. It'll find all of them. Okay? So it's all pairs, shortest paths. And it's actually a very easy to code algorithm. It's very short. So I'll just go ahead and write the algorithm right now. So there, let's see. So uh, n is the number of vertices. Okay. Hold on. Let me let me before I write that. Let me give you some structure. So Floyd Warshall needs an adjacency matrix. So how many vertices? Three, six. So six by six ver uh, adjacency matrix. There's a row column for each vertex. C, D, E, F. So here we're going to update this adjacency matrix with all of the different paths. So first let's fill it out based on the graph. So zeros on the diagonal, uh, A to B is 2, A to C is infinity, A to D infinity, A to E infinity, A to F 10. B to C, I'm just not going to draw diagonal because it's going to be the same. So then B to C, 2, B to D, infinity, B to E, 5, B to F, infinity. C to D is 1, C to E, infinity and C to F is infinity as well. D to E, one, and infinity, and E to F, two. Okay, so this is what our adjacency matrix looks like. So we're going to update this with all of the paths. So when we're done, A to B is gonna be the shortest path, the weight of the shortest path from A to B, B to E is going to be the weight of the shortest path from B to E. B to F will be the weight of the shortest path from B to F. So the way we're going to do this is really easy. It's three loops. So for int i, sorry, int k equals zero to n minus one, where n equals the number of vertices. So for k equals zero, I'm just write two, n minus one. Then we're gonna have another loop for int i equals zero to n minus one. Then for int j equals zero 
2 and minus 1. And remember this order because it's important. It's k, i, j. So what each of these is, we have a path, we already have a path from i vertex i to j. We already have that. It might be infinity, it, it could be whatever, but there is a path like that that already exists. So what we're going to check is we're going to see if instead of going directly from i to j, if we go from i to k and then k to j, is that going to be better? So imagine you have vertex k right here. We're going to check if adding up, um, you call this A and this B and C, we're going to see is B plus C better than just going with our current path. So we're going to see if we can improve it by moving through K. That's the general idea of Floyd Warshaw. So now all you have to do so if, uh, let's just call this an array, array at i, so going from i to k plus array k j, that's less than what we already have, array i, j, then we're just going to update array at i, j with the new path. So if you can see it, that's the entire algorithm. So it's one, two, three, four, five lines of code. And that's going to find all of the pair's shortest paths. So I'll walk through it real quick on this example. So first we're going to consider A to be our intermediate vertex. So then we're going to see, okay, to go from B to C, is it better to use A? So this is going to be annoying to do, but I'll do it anyway. So we have, I'm going to erase this. So we have K, I, J, and we have the vertices A, B, C, D, E, and F. So initially, everything is A, right? So K, I, and J. Uh, so here, it's just going to stay the same. So I'm going to start off at something more interesting, B and C. So we're going to see if we can improve the path from B to C, so B to C, by going through A. So we're going to look at B to A. B to A is right here. It's 2. Here, let me fill out. Okay, so B to A is 2 plus uh, A to C. A to C is infinity, so that's no good. That's not going to improve anything. So um, B to C, so now let's consider B to D. That's not going to improve anything. B to E, that's not going to improve anything. Um, B to F, that may improve something. So let's see, if we go to, if we go from B to A, so B to A is 2 plus A to F 
a to f is 10, is that better than what we already have for b to f? So is 2 plus 10 less than infinity? Yes, it is. So we're going to update this with 12. So that's our first improvement. So now we'll change this to C. Okay, and then we'll look at D. So going from C to D, A is not going to help anything. Uh, C to C to E, A won't help anything there. And then C to F. It's not going to help anything to go through A either. Right? Because C to A is currently infinity. So anything we try to do that involves going from C to A isn't going to help. So now let's do D, E. Um, so A to D right now is also infinity, so that's not going to help. So A to E is also infinity. A to F uh, can't really help because we're out of stuff to pick for J. So now let's go see if B can help something. So so can we use B to help get from A to C? So right now, between A and C, we have infinity. So let's check if going from A to B and then B to C is going to help. So A to B is 2. A to C, or sorry, B to C is also 2, so that improves it to 4. So A to C now becomes 4. So you can see we could just keep doing this and update all of these cells, and it's essentially going to find all the pairs of the shortest paths. Um, you, got, you could finish working out this example if you wanted to. It might take a while. It's much easy. It's really easy to code, but hard to do by hand. Um, so yeah, I'm not going to finish this. But you get the idea of how the algorithm works. So this is a very useful algorithm. It's quick to code. The running time is really easy. It's just three loops. So it's O of n cubed. Um, so and it gives you a lot of information about the graph. It gives you the shortest path between all pairs of points. So one neat trick you can do with Floyd Warshaw is that it does work with negative edge weights. So th this, unlike Dijkstra, this uh, does work with negative edge weights. And this is essentially because it's going to look at every intermediate vertex possible and so it'll see not, not not really all of the paths but it will consider every vertex so if there's an edge with a negative weight it'll consider that edge at some point and it'll improve uh, improve the path with that edge. So it handles negative edge weights, and it can also be used to detect uh, negative cycles. So like if you have a negative cycle in the graph where if we wanted to find, well, I'll, I'll get into that, but let's say if we had this edge right here and it had like a negative 10 on it, and we wanted to go from C to F, we could go here and just keep going in a circle between A, B, and E and essentially make the, the distance from C to F negative infinity, which doesn't really make sense. So the way you can detect that with Floyd Warshaw is once you've run your three loops, 
run the run it uh, do one more loop and see so like normally you would have uh, for k equals zero to n minus one run that one run that one more time and see if uh, see if your graph changes. If your adjacency matrix changes, then there is a negative cycle somewhere because once that those terminates, it should be set at the lowest path. So if it's not, then that means there has to be a negative cycle. Okay, so that's Floyd Warshall. It does all pair shortest paths. It's a really cool algorithm and it's very easy to code and implement. Okay. So those are the different algorithms for shortest paths. So next I'm going to talk about minimum spanning trees. So minimum spanning trees. So this is always abbreviated MST. So if you ever see MST, this is what it is referring to. So a minimum spanning tree is just a collection of the edges that uh, spans the graph. So it connects the graph. Like here, an example of a spanning tree would be this edge, this edge, this edge, would be that. Because here you can see that every vertex is on an edge and it's connected. Okay, so that's all that a spanning tree is. Now a minimum spanning tree is this, a spanning tree that has uh, the minimum weight of a graph has the minimum weight possible. So here, the last one we picked was uh, obviously not the minimum weight. It included the 10, the 7, and the 5, the three largest edges, right? So it was weight like 25. We could obviously do better. So there are two different algorithms. Well, first, I'll, I'll show you the minimum spanning tree. So the minimum spanning tree of this graph would just be 1, 1, 2, two, two, right? So that's going to have weight eight rather than weight 25. So this is the minimum spanning tree. So one thing to note here is that a graph can have multiple minimum spanning trees. So if we just take this simple graph, A, B, C, D, where all the edge weights have weight one, the minimum spanning tree could be here. That could be the minimum spanning tree. Or we could take that to be the minimum spanning tree. Here we could leave out any of the edges. Any, any selection of the three edges would be a valid minimum spanning tree. So the minimum spanning tree is not unique. However, the weight of the minimum spanning tree is unique because, I mean, it's the minimum. It has to be unique. So the weight of every minimum spanning tree for this graph is going to be 3, and the weight of every minimum spanning tree for this graph is going to be 8. But there could be multiple different ways to achieve that minimum. Okay, so I'll go over some, some little properties of the minimum spanning tree. So, one is not unique. So, 
MST is not unique. The weight as one, two of MST is unique. So then another another thing. If your graph has n vertices, every spanning tree has exactly n minus one edges. Right, so here you can see we have one, two, three, four, five, six vertices. We have one, two, three, four, five edges in our spanning tree. We it has to have exactly n minus one because if we left out an edge, our minimum spanning tree wouldn't be connected. It would no longer be a tree, it would be a disconnected graph. Or it wouldn't cover all of the vertices. And if we added an edge, if we wanted to like add this edge right here then we're adding a cycle, then we're, we must be adding a cycle right there between A, B, C, D, and E, and then it's no longer a tree because there's a cycle. And remember, trees are graphs without cycles, connected graphs without cycles. So three is always true. If it, if it has n vertices, every spanning tree, not just minimum spanning tree, every single spanning tree has exactly n minus one edges. So that's a, that's a good terminating condition for the algorithms I'm about to, about to show you guys. Okay, so the two different algorithms are prims and cross schools. So these are both going to be greedy algorithms. Okay. So how premise works is you have a starting vertex. So you're going to have a starting vertex, and then we're going to add, let's call it V, and I'll call it S, S to, so we're going to add S, um, sorry that doesn't make sense, we're going to Add S to um, the component C. So we're just going to have some component that's just the current vertices we're considering. Um, so we're going to add a, a component, and component is just like a subgraph. So we're going to add S to C. So look at all edges uh, adjacent to C. So we're going to look at all of the edges adjacent to our component, and we're going to take the minimum weight edge. So we'll take the minimum weight edge that's adjacent to our component. So let's say that this edge connects vertices A and B and A is the vertex that's in C. Right? Because it, it has to be adjacent to C so one of these two vertices uh, has to be adjacent has to be in our component. So if that's the case 
then we're going to add a b to our minimum spanning tree and we're going to add b to our component and we're just going to keep doing this until everything's in our component until we've seen everything so what this is going to look like Let's say we use f as our starting vertex. I'll do this in blue. Choose f as our starting vertex. So now let's look at everything adjacent to, the, to our component. Our component is everything circled in blue. So the least weight edge is either going to be a 10 or a 2. Or it's going to be out of 10 or 2. So 2 is the least weight. So we're going to add that edge to our minimum spanning tree and add E to our component. So now we look at everything adjacent to our component again. We have 10, 7, 5, and 1. 1 is the least weight again, so we're going to add it to our minimum spanning tree and add D to our component. Okay, then we're going to move on to the next step. We're going to look at 10, 7, 5, and 1 again. 1 is the least weight, so we add it. Okay, then we're going to look at all the edges again. So 10, 7, 5, and 2. 2 is the least weight. So we add D. And there we go. And now we look at all the edges again. We, we would not consider this edge because it's between two vertices in our component. And we want one vertex to be in our component and one vertex to be out. So we're, we're basically going to ignore this edge at this point. This is a bad edge. Because if we were to add this edge, it would create a cycle, which we said can't happen in a minimum spanning tree because it can't happen in a tree. So even if, I, mean, I know this isn't the lowest weight edge, but if it were, we would still ignore it. Okay, so now we look, consider 10, 7, and 2. And 2 is the least weight. So we take this edge, and we add it to our component, and now everything's in our component, so we've found the minimum spanning tree. Or we, we've chosen n minus 1 edges, so now everything's in our minimum spanning tree. Either condition works. Um, so yeah, you can see that that found the minimum spanning tree just fine. So this is the basic algorithm for prims. Okay, so let's see. So, Prim's algorithm really works well with an adjacency list. Um, and I say this because the next algorithm I'm about to show you works well with an edge list. So, So Prim's algorithm, there are two things really. You should have an adjacency list for this. Adjacency list. And it's better on a dense graph. It's better it's better compared to the other algorithm I'm about to show you. And yeah. This is because there will be, um, like here, let me, let me just describe the next algorithm and this will make more sense. So for this one, I'm going to change the graph a little bit. Okay. A, 
B, C, G, E, F. So let's have one, two, three, one, two, three, five, six. So this is our graph, and we're going to we want to find the minimum spanning tree of it. Okay, so we could run prims and it would still work just fine on this graph, but I'm going to show you another algorithm that works well as also. So Kruskal's Kruskal's algorithm. Basically, you're going to take in an edge list. And you're going to sort the edges by weight. So now we'll have the all of the edges ordered by weight, so we can pick the least weight edge and visit them in that order from lowest weight to highest weight. Um, Visit edges from least weight to most weight, and then if an edge does not create a cycle. So we're going to visit the edges from least to most weight. And if an edge does not create a cycle, we're going to add it to our minimum spanning tree. So if the, um, if the if we can add the edge without creating a cycle, then we're just going to go ahead and add it to our minimum spanning tree. If an edge does not create a cycle, add to minimum spanning tree. So what is this going to look like? She's blue. So we're going to visit the edges from least weight to most weight. So the first edge, it's really arbitrary. We could either choose BD or AF. I'll just go with AF. So we're going to take it. It doesn't create a cycle, so we're going to add it to our minimum spanning tree. So that's our minimum spanning tree. Now we look at all of the edges on the entire graph again. Notice here that there's no starting vertex, unlike with prems. We just consider the entire graph. So now this is our next lowest weight, and it does not create a cycle. And so we add it to our minimum spanning tree. Now we look at our whole graph again, and we have 2 is our next lowest. So we will add it to our minimum spanning tree because it does not create a cycle. And when I say create a cycle, I mean create a cycle with our, within our minimum spanning tree out of the edges we've already uh, added to our minimum spanning tree. So now we have those three. We look at our graph again. 2 right here is the least weight edge that we haven't chosen yet. So now, now we're going to look at our graph. So 3 right here is the least weight edge. But we're not going to pick it because we, want, we can only choose edges that does not create a cycle. So if we added this 3, we would have a cycle right here, which is not allowed in a tree. So we can't pick this. So we've considered this edge, but we're going to ignore it. So same thing here. We can't choose this edge because it would create a cycle. So we're going to ignore it. Okay, and then now there's only two edges left to consider, five or six, and we choose five because it's the least weight edge. And then we, if we were going until we chose n minus one edges, here we would stop, or we could just go through all the edges and say this six here is gonna create a cycle. If we were to choose it, it would create this cycle right here between a, B, D, E, and F. So we can't choose six, and you would see that there isn't any more, there aren't any other edges that you could choose that wouldn't create a cycle. So you, you should really just stop once you've chosen 
and minus one edges. You shouldn't consider any other ones. Okay, so this is the minimum spanning tree for this graph. So one thing, notice if we just back up one step, as we were building this minimum spanning tree, we had multiple components. We had a component here and a component here. And we had already visited both E and D. Um, we had already visited E and D throughout our algorithm, yet we still chose an edge connecting both of them. So how would we go about implementing this? Obviously, we can't just use a visited list and say as long as one of the uh, vertices hasn't been visited, we add that new edge. We can't do that because I just gave you an example right here where both ver vertices have been visited, but we still had to choose that edge. So how can we get around that and implementing this? We're going to use a structure called a disjoint sets. Called disjoint sets. So let me explain what that is. So disjoint sets. So basically, we're going to have a forest And this is just a collection of trees. Makes sense with the naming. Collection of trees. And this forest is going to contain all of our components that, all of the components in our current minimum spanning tree uh, state, I guess. Because here, like I had earlier, we had two different components. The components themselves are going to be trees because we're not allowed to have cycles, so this is accurate. Okay. So how we're going to do this? Let me just erase all of these. So we're going to have some disjoint sets, and each set is going to have a representative element that basically represents the entire set. So since we have a tree structure, what there, if we have a tree, there is an obvious choice to uh, decide what's going to represent this tree, and that's the root. Right? It's easy to just go and have the root represent all of the, um, to represent each node. So the root is going to be the representative element for each set. And so the root equals representative element. So this way we can see if two elements are in the same set by seeing if their representative elements are the same. So let's say we had uh, we wanted to check if so let's call this node A, this node B, and this node C. So we wanted to check to see if B, and so this is a forest, so there could be other trees out here. We wanted to see if B and C were in the same set. So how we would do that is we would find the representative element of B, which would mean go find the root. And so B, so the representative element of B is equal to A. Okay, and then we would find the representative element of C, and it's A, because we're just going up to the root. So the representative element of C is also equal to A, so that's how we know that B and C are both in the same set. 
So now let's, let's call this one D and this one E. So now let's see if E and C are in the same set. So the representative element of E is going to be, we're going to go up here and then here, and that's going to equal D. And then the representative element of C is still A. So here, the representative elements are different, so we know that they're not in the same set. Okay. So now why, why does this help us? So you can imagine, so each component is a tree. So is, if we have an edge, it connects two vertices. So maybe we had an edge between B and C, uh, which we do. If B and C are in the same set, that means they're already in the same component. And since each component is a tree, we can't add any more edges to it edges between vertices in the same component or we would create a cycle. So with this we can check to see if two vertices are in the same component and make it easy for us to throw out edges to see if they would create a cycle or not. And, this, and, and we can also check to see if they're not in the same component then, uh, then we can add that edge safely. So let's walk through the algorithm with this new disjoint set structure. So the first thing you have to do with uh, this structure is create a forest of just degenerate trees where uh, each tree is basically its own representative element. So A, B, C, D, E, F. So they're all just their own little tree. They're all on their own component. So now let's consider our first edge, A, F. So we're going to look at A, A's representative element, and F's representative element. They're different because right now they're just themselves. So it's safe to add this edge. And when we add that edge, what we're going to do is we're going to connect the sets. So all that means is we're going to take this F and we're just going to make it point to A. So now F's representative element is A and A's representative element is also A. So they're in the same set, they have the same representative element, everything's good. So now let's do the same thing with this edge. B and D have different representative elements. So we can safely choose this edge to be in our minimum spanning tree. B and D. So now let's make D point to B. Okay. So now let's look at our next edge, F and E. So what we have to do now is look at the representative element of F the representative element of E. So here the representative element of F is equal to A. The representative element of E is equal to E. So they're different so it's safe to pick that edge. So here I'm going to just take this this is arbitrary, it doesn't really matter. I'm just going to make this whole structure point to E. So notice to make uh, make all of these, all of their new representative elements change, I only have to make the old representative element point to E. I don't have to change what F points to, or if it had any other children, I don't have to change what they point to. I just have to update the main element, the representative element. I just have to make A point to whatever I want the new uh, representative element to be. And so it's really easy to merge two, two disjoint sets together. I just have to change one pointer and then it's done because we're just going to keep going all the way up to the root. Okay. So now I've merged them and I've added the 
edge FE. So notice here that I, in my disjoint set, I have this edge between A and E. That's not the edge that I chose in my graph. I chose FE. So this disjoint set isn't necessarily, it's not the edges that we chose in the graph. It's just the component. So F, A, and E are all in the same component, but uh, the edge A, E is not in the component. Right? This is just a way to group them all together. It's not dictating which edges we chose that actually connect them. So we would be keeping track of our minimum spanning tree elsewhere. Okay, so the next edge we're going to choose is C and D. So let's look at the representative elements. Representative element of C is equal to C. Representative element of D is equal to B. So they're different, so it's safe to choose this edge. So I'll just make C point to B. Okay, so now we have our two components. So the next edge we would consider is AE. So what's, we'll get the representative element of A, that's equal to E, and the representative element of E, and that's also equal to E. So they're equal, so I can't choose them because they're in the same component. If I added this edge, then I would have a cycle. So I can't do that. So I'm just going to skip that edge. So now let's do the same thing with B and C. That would be the next edge that I would consider. Uh, B and C. B and C. And get their representative elements. So the representative element of B is B. The representative element of C is also B. So once again, this would create a cycle. So I can't have that. I can't add this edge to my minimum spanning tree because they have this, they're already in the same component. Okay, so the next edge I consider is E and D. So the representative element of E is just going to be E and the representative element of D is going to be B. So they are not the same representative element, so it's safe to it's safe to choose that edge because we know it's not going to create a cycle. So we choose this edge. And then we can merge them. So BDC. B. And so to merge them. All I have to do is make B the representative element of this set point to the other representative element. So now everything is in the same set and we've chosen the correct number of edges. So that's how you use disjoint sets to implement cross schools and how you, uh, how you prevent yourself from adding edges that would create cycles. So that's just an easy way to check. Um, it's pretty easy to implement. It's rather efficient. So one thing you can do to improve the running time of this is, so let's say now for some reason we were calling the representative element of D. So when we call, we would have some method that would find the representative element of D. So when we do this lookup, we're going to go from B to E, right? And then we're going, to, we're going to keep doing that every time we want to get the representative element of D. So what we can do instead is we can speed it up. Once we, once we, every time we make this call, let's just update it to point directly to it, right? So now we, now we don't have to go through B anymore. D just knows its representative element is, is E because this isn't ever going to change, right? E is always going to be uh, in the same set as D because all of the disjoint sets, the only operations are to merge them, right? 
to either get the representative element or to merge the sets. We're not going to be splitting them up. So it's okay to just change D to point to E. So same thing if you were to get the representative element of F. We could take this F and just make it point directly to the E. So you can see now it's one fewer step the next time we have to look up F, which could happen. F could have a really high degree, could have a lot of edges that use it, so we might be looking it up a lot. So that is one optimization that increase that will improve your running time by uh, a good bit. So it's not necessary for the algorithm, but it will improve your running time, so that's always a good thing. Okay, so that's pretty much all there is to minimum spanning trees. So now I'll get back to my comparison of the two algorithms. So the two algorithms are Prems and Kruskal. So Prems, as I said, is better for an adjacency list. Or that, that's just the structure it needs. Because if you remember, we wanted to get all the adjacent vertices of our component at each step. And so an adjacency list uh, lends it to that well, lends itself to that well. Um, and then across and Kruskal's, our first step was to sort all of the edges. So an edge list is better uh, in this case. Okay, and then prems is better on a dense graph whereas cross goals is better on a sparse graph. This is because here, when we are, when we have an edge list, if we have a really dense graph, that means it has a bunch of edges. So we have to sort the entire edge list. We, we have to know that we're picking the least weight edge. So when we do that, if we have a really dense graph with as many edges as possible, we're going to be sorting every single edge. So, I mean, that, that's not very, that's not incredibly slow, but it'll be slower than what Prims does. Because Prims only has to look at a subset of the edges each time. Even if the graph is complete, it could still skip some edges because as you add things to the component, um, you're, you're only going to look at the new adjacencies. You're not going to look at... It, you, you're, you're not going to have to consider every edge where you have to, where you have to in Kruskal's. Because Kruskal's, you obviously have to consider every edge. In Prim's, there's a chance of you skipping over some edges as you add things to the component. Because... Yeah. So that, that's the basic idea. So just know that prims is better on a dense graph, cross goal is better on a sparse graph. Um, it really, it doesn't make much of a difference. They're both really quick algorithms, so they have the same running time. So just what, whichever one you're more comfortable with coding is fine. So some applications of minimum spanning trees. So it, it's, a, it's a really good problem. So let's say you had some room and you had a bunch of like computers. So this is a computer, this is a computer, and, you, and it's like a complete graph. And you wanted to know, and, and you needed to connect all these computers with some cables. So what would be the least amount of cable you need to connect all of these computers? So, 
assuming you have to connect all the computers, it might be something like this, right? So you, you could build, what you could do is build a complete graph between uh, all of the all of the computers and give them a weight based on the distance and then find the minimum spanning tree of that graph and that will give you the best layout of the cables to connect your computers. So that's just a small example. Um, you could also imagine like pow give, getting power to a city. If you made a large graph of all of the buildings, what's the best way to run cable that way? That's a much larger problem and will save a lot more money. Um, it's very, so this has some very practical applications. Uh, same thing with like roads. What's the best way to build roads to connect all these cities? Uh, what's the cheapest way? What's the most efficient way? You can use your minimum spanning tree to figure that out. What's the best way to lay out the roads that span all the cities? So a minimum spanning tree solves a wide range of problems. Um, is a very good algorithm to know. So yeah. So cross goals better on sparse graphs. I prefer Kruskal's. It's really easy to implement disjoint sets. Uh, it's surprisingly easy, actually. If you go look it up on Wikipedia, it's the updating the representative element and merging them. Each method is about two or three lines of code. It's a really, it's a really nice algorithm. So I would recommend going to look that up. Um, other than that, I'm done. So I hope you guys enjoyed this lecture. And there will be another one next week, I believe. I'm not sure what the topic is on, but hopefully you show up to that one as well. I will see you guys later.